the Financial Survival Network, helping you to survive and thrive in the new economy. This is the Financial Survival Network. Financial Survival Network is presented to you by Regal Assets. Buy and sell physical gold and silver through your existing retirement plan, 100% tax-free with Regal Assets. If you want to include physical gold or silver in your existing IRA or old 401k, request your free investment kit, which was recently featured in the Forbes and Smart Money Wall Street Journal magazines. Call toll-free 855-678-6620, 855-678-6620, or visit regalassets.com. Mark Faber a.k.a. Dr. Doom, is back for an interview. He's been calling for the death of fiat currency for years, and his least favorite person in the world, Ben Bernanke, money printer extraordinaire, is still at it. The nonstop torrent of fiat dollars, euros, yuan, you name it, yen, it's going to continue unabated until, until the collapse. Mark, how are you? Great to have you back on. Very well, and thank you for having me on your program. It's always a pleasure. So where is the world right now? Are we waiting for the next shoe to drop, or is everything kind of okay? For sure. There will be a very big shoe to drop. The question is when. And you understand, if you have the printing presses, you can postpone problems for quite some time, but obviously not forever. Right. So, so you always say Bernanke, he's just a money printer. There's nothing else that he can Correct. do. Basically, what the central banks and uh, the financial elite has brainwashed the public with is that deflation is a disaster and inflation is good, so by all means, keep on inflating. But the evidence is quite different. Over the last 30 years, real wages for the average worker in America has been declining, and household income over the last 10 years, despite of massive money printing and credit expansion, has been collapsing, whereas in the deflationary period, 1873 to 1900, real wages rose because wages didn't go down a lot. They were quite stable, but at the same time, the price level went down. So the purchasing power of wages and incomes went up. That's always bad for the banks. And in fact, they called the Depression of 1873, they called it the Great Depression, but they changed that name once the 30s hit. And the fact is, in the so-called Great Depression of the 30s, we actually had real incomes increasing for those who were still employed as well, didn't we? Well, I don't have the precise statistics about the 1930s, but about the 19. The, the 1873 to 1900 period, I have precise statistics, and their real wages actually rose. So all I want to say is, it doesn't matter what the nominal price level is. What matters is what the real price level is and what real wages and real incomes are. But of course, I want to point out the one fact. If you print money, you create an increase in wealth inequality and you favor a few at the expense of the many. In other words, you penalize the large portion of the population at the expense of the Wall Street establishment and the politicians and the lobbies. Yeah, no doubt that's true. And some would say that the system was intentionally designed to ensure that outcome. Do, do you think that's the case? Well, I'm not sure about that because the politicians are not that smart. <laughs> but it just evolved into this. Yeah. And very clearly, if you look at Wall Street, 
which is a power, very powerful lobby in the United States, and you look at the well-to-do people that own stocks and so forth, in their heart, they all like to see rising stock prices, rising real estate prices, and so forth and so on, because they are the ones that own the assets. Yeah, exactly. And um, the fact is we have in the U.S., and I would think now in the world, we have a bloated financial sector where all these people who could have been aerospace engineers, who could have actually been making stuff, now they make algorithms for trying to squeeze that last 18, 88th or 100th of a basis point out of a trade. Are those people really usefully employed well, I have argued for years that uh, basically in an economy, of course, a financial system is necessary to collect the money from the savers and to lend it to the entrepreneurs so they can build businesses and so forth and so on. But the financial sector has outgrown the real economy disproportionately over the last 30 years. And so you have now a real economy that is, say, 100% larger than 30 years ago, and you have a financial sector that is a thousand times higher than uh, 30 years ago. In other words, the financial sector has no longer the function to channel savings into investments, but it has the function to keep on speculating in all kinds of weird products yeah and they come up with uh, derivatives and all sorts of other financial sure, instruments and, uh, mortgage-backed securities <laughs> yeah. and cdos and cbos and god knows what my view is the financial sector will continue to be deflated very badly and in the end there will be no derivatives market it will just collapse under its own the problem for the investor, if you look at MF Global, at Peregrine, and recently another company went bust, I forgot the name, the investor is not protected. The banks are protected. And so as an investor, you have to ask yourself, where do I want to keep my money and where do I want to keep my securities? Because the system is badly rigged. And the answer to that is? Well, I think looking at the world, I have to say in the U.S. and not everywhere, not in the high-end areas of New York and of San Francisco and Newport Beach, but by and large in the U.S., real estate is now reasonably priced compared to everything else in the world. So I would own some real estate. Secondly, I would own some physical gold and silver, but of course not deposited uh, in ETFs or in ETF forms or in American banks, because that may be taken away from you one day, but I would own it physically and preferably outside the U.S. I think it's very important for investors to understand the people that were rich in Russia in 1900 and didn't have any money outside Russia, they lost everything in 1918. And the people that were rich in China in 1949, when the communists came in, and they didn't have money outside China, they lost everything. So you need a geographical diversification. Now, the U.S. government is making this very difficult, but it still can be done. I'm not a tax advisor, but say, you as an American citizen, you can go anywhere in the world. Most likely you can't open a bank account. Nobody wants you. But you yeah. can buy real estate. That is a possibility. Yeah, I see. So you think real estate is looking like it's, it's pretty much bottomed out now in uh, most markets? Well, in markets. the U.S., in, in Asia, it's not cheap anymore. It's uh, in some places very expensive. But as I said... It's like art. There is a money laundering aspect to real estate and art. 
you can't loan their money anymore through banks. They're very careful, and they are supervised. But the Brazilian drug dealer, or say, better express, the Colombian drug dealer, he can go to Miami and buy 20 apartments. Hmm. So, so effectively, even the uh, black market is moving into tangible assets, real goods, instead of paper. Okay. Correct. So, so think like a money launderer and put your money into something that has real value and that will get you through it and geographical diversity because you really think the government is going to be out confiscating people's wealth literally at the barrel of a gun. Well, I think I don't have a very high opinion of the public as an investor when they invest uh, in concert like in NASDAQ in 2000 or in commodities in 2008. But there must be a reason why the volume of individual investors in equity markets, not just in the U.S., everywhere else, is essentially dead. People don't trust the market anymore. And if you look at people like Corzine and so forth, then obviously there is a reason for not trusting the markets anymore. Yeah, absolutely. The credibility of the markets is being undermined because... Completely, it, it completely. used to be a place where you could trust that if you deposited your money to an account, you would be able to have the use of it. And as we've learned recently in three separate instances, that no longer is the case. The Correct. Sentinel case, I think, was the other one you were referring to where the court exactly. just said it's it's okay for them to steal your money and cross-collateralize it because they didn't... Yes, absolutely. Yeah, they didn't really I mean to amazing. steal it. <laughs> it's just incredible. Yeah, so yeah, it's, it's really kind of sad because if you don't have confidence and you don't have trust, the system really can't continue and it won't function. And like you said, it used to be the purpose of Wall Street was to allocate capital instead of running a casino. And without that function of allocating capital, how can you have growth in an economy? It just can't be done. Absolutely. So, so how much longer is, is this, I would call it a depression, how much longer do you think it's going to take to wring all this stuff, the excess, out of the system and get rid of the debt? Well, it could happen tomorrow. It could happen in three years' time. You know, it's very difficult to put a finger exactly on the timing. I happen to think that today's upside breakout on the S&P is more likely to be a false breakout than a genuine breakout. We had a very tight trading range over the last few say over the last 10 days, and now we broke out on the upside. But uh, I wouldn't uh, bet on this trend continuing. I think a correction will come, and maybe we'll have another rally towards the end of August. I think October and November could be quite ugly. Yeah, and September is is not looking too pleasant. And somebody told me he thinks it's in large measure due to agricultural cycles that we used to have in the U.S. where banks would loan money in the uh, spring and they'd get their loans paid off in the fall after the harvest. And then you'd have bad harvests and you'd have busts and things like that would happen. I, th I think it's definitely a cycle in humanity that fall inevitably the worst things happen then. Yes, could be. I mean, I, I'm not sure about uh, the precise timing. But I would say, I think investors need to be diversified. They shouldn't own all cash because cash is dangerous in an environment where the cost of living are going up substantially. Insurance premiums, health care, taxi fares, tunnel fares, parking. Yeah, everything. And of course, everything is going up except the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the government finds a way to tell you that actually energy prices are going down, that food prices are going down. <laughs> 
You know, I always say I'm really happy that we don't have inflation because the prices are going up so badly now that if we had inflation, we'd really be in trouble, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know but that old... what I mean is <laughs> the problem with the money printing by Bernanke is that wages didn't go up, but the cost of living went up. And yeah. so the typical family is badly squeezed. Yeah, I know. I'm one of them. I mean, I'm not like crying poverty, but, but I can feel the difference. And I know when I go to the gas station and I fill my car up and it costs $85 of, of non-inflationary gasoline, that prices are going up regardless of what they're saying. And that's at the same time, Mark, demand's going down for gasoline in the United States and probably around the world. Yeah, sure. I mean, not in Asia. Gasoline, uh, I mean... Uh... The demand for oil is rising, but from a very low level on a per capita basis. But I can see that in the U.S., the costs have gone up so much that a lot of people don't take taxis anymore. In New York, they just the taxi fares went just up by 17%. And nationwide, the rental prices, I mean, the rentals, have gone up 9%. In San Francisco, 15% over the last 12 months. So, yeah. you know, families who suddenly have to pay 10% more for their flats and they don't earn more money, they're being squeezed. Mm -hmm. Well, one final question, and it's an ongoing debate among many of the people who appear on financialsurvivalnetwork.com, but some people say deflation, others say inflation. Do you think that hyperinflation is a possible outcome to all this money printing? Yes, I think it's a possibility, but we don't know how the world will look like in five years' time. We could have hyperinflation. I would lean towards uh, high inflation and hyperinflation eventually, but I'm not sure about this. So. All I can say is financial survival is about diversification and about personal survival. I would recommend your listeners to own a property in the countryside. Mm -hmm. And I would recommend them to own some physical gold and some equities. I'm not bullish about the world, but you understand, if you print money... Since 2009, the lows at 666 on the S&P. On March 6, 2009, the S&P has more than doubled. Remarkable. It's not because the world is a great place. It's worse off today than then. But there has been money printing everywhere. Exactly. Well, Mark and so, you know, if you say, oh, I don't trust anything. I want to hold only cash. Then you have to decide what kind of cash. I would say if you really only want to own cash, then I would say probably gold is the best cash you can own. But it can also drop, you know, maybe it drops and you have no cash flow. If you own a rental property and you let it out, you may have a cash flow or income of 5%. In Asia, I can buy stocks. They have a 5% dividend yield. Yeah, it sounds like it. There, there's good value there, and uh, the high dividend stocks are certainly have certainly been in demand. Well, Mark, hey, we appreciate you coming on. We'll talk to you again soon. You thank know, you very much. Thank you so much. You be well. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.